What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about post-meal glucose excursions. Do you need to be worried? Glucose excursions. We're going on a trip down the land of science. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment Oh, the algorithm. This has come about by the recent wave of people wearing continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, as well as being popularized by a social media influencer who goes by the name of Glucose Goddess. A lot of her content is around really limiting your post-meal glucose increases. Her reasoning is that glucose is toxic and obviously high blood glucose is not good for you. And indeed, if we look at people who have high basal levels of blood glucose, they're what we call pre-diabetic or diabetic, and that has a whole host of health issues that go alongside of it. And this has led to many people also getting continuous glucose monitors to monitor how much glucose they have after a meal. Now, I've been long skeptical of this because I do not think post-meal hormonal and metabolic milieu is reflective of long-term outcomes. As I have said many times, if we are looking at post-meal outcomes, then we can't eat dietary fat because it impedes flow median dilation and flow median dilation is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So can't eat dietary fat because of what happens after the meal. And if we look at protein, well, protein increases mTOR and IGF-1 and those are thought to be contributing to cancer. So can't eat protein and then we can't eat carbs because it increases blood glucose. But the reality is, is what happens in a short term is not reflective of the long term. All we need to do is look at the research on exercise. If I told you I was going to have you do something that was going to increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure, increase your inflammation, increase your oxidative stress, you would tell me, hell no, I'm not doing that. But that's exactly what exercise does. But what does it do in the long term? It lowers all those things and reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. That being said, I'm not saying that eating carbs is like exercise or anything like that. I'm just saying that short-term acute responses do not necessarily reflect long-term outcomes. One of the things that she has said is that you should eat your foods in a specific order so that you limit your blood glucose excursions. Now, she references a paper frequently on this where they look at eating vegetables and proteins before the starchy carbohydrates versus eating starchy carbohydrates first and they see a difference in the area under the curve of glucose as well as insulin, I believe. What's interesting about this study is when you look at the study, they only measure it out to three hours. And if you look at the curve, neither of those meals has the blood glucose come back to baseline. In the starchy carb first group, if you look at it, it does peak higher. At the three hour mark, it appears to be heading back to baseline more rapidly than the other group that had a more blunted effect. We don't know what happens after that because they didn't measure out past that. And that's not a criticism of the researchers. You have to pick a time point and they probably thought three hours would be enough. And in this case, it probably wasn't. So I'm not convinced that the area under the curve would actually be different if they measured out way longer. But either way, it is still a short term experiment. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. But the researcher who conducted that first experiment more recently did a 16 week human randomized control trial with pre-diabetic subjects looking at eating every single meal with the protein and vegetable first before the starchy carbohydrate versus another group that ate their starchy carbs first. And they looked at things like uh, fasting blood glucose, they looked at HbA1c, and HbA1c is really the one we wanna focus in on here. HbA1c is a site on hemoglobin that can become what's called glycosylated depending on your concentrations of glucose in the blood. So people who have higher blood glucose concentrations over a 24 hour period will have greater amounts of glycosylated hemoglobin. And this tends to reflect long-term blood glucose control and insulin sensitivity more precisely because red blood cells take about 90 days to turn over. So when you're seeing this outcome what you're looking at is long-term insulin sensitivity and blood glucose regulation. If people are actually having more blood glucose, there's a total area under the curve over 24 hours, we would expect to see differences in HbA1c. What did they find? After 16 weeks, HbA1c was lower in the 
vegetable and protein first group by about 1%, a relative 1%. And the actual raw change was 0.1. The other group was 0.03. This did not reach significance. It was a trend for a difference, but it was not clinically significant. Does this matter? The group that was doing vegetables and protein first lost a little bit more body weight than the group that was doing starchy carbs first. And while they say they equated for calories, this was a free living study, they didn't equate for calories. What likely happened was the people eating the protein and vegetables first were more satiated and didn't eat as much starchy carb. Hey, listen, that's a check mark in that column, okay? That can be a good reason to do that. So they lost significantly more body weight and that completely explains the small difference in HbA1c. This change in HbA1c was minuscule and not clinically significant. We say clinically significant, meaning like, does it actually have an impact? Because you can have something that's statistically significant, even though this wasn't, it did not reach statistical significance, it was just a trend. You can have something that reaches statistical significance, but it's so small that it's not what we call clinically significant. It does not appear that over the long term, Doing this will independently lower your 24-hour blood glucose or improve your blood glucose regulation or insulin sensitivity. Now, that being said, it may be beneficial to eat your protein and fibrous carbohydrate first because it may be more satiating than if you eat your starchy carb first or mix that together and eat it however you like. This falls under the category of making a mountain out of a molehill, stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. If you are, you know, watching your calories, if you are exercising, if you're doing the big things right, okay, if you want to eat protein and fibrous carbohydrate first, cool. If you feel that helps you stay more satiated, cool. Could be a very useful tool in that aspect. But does it uniquely improve blood glucose regulation and insulin sensitivity? And the answer, at least based off of this study, the first study looking at this over a long term, is no. My problem is not with those claims of glucose goddess, it's that she makes some extreme claims about glucose every time you have a glucose spike, it's increasing your biological age and all this kind of nonsense. Blood glucose increases in response to a meal are completely normal, they are not unhealthy. If you gain too much body weight and you become insulin resistant where your blood glucose remains elevated, that is very unhealthy. But let's stop demonizing short-term changes in blood glucose because they do not reflect long-term changes in blood glucose regulation and insulin sensitivity, especially not based on the data we have now. And I mean, of course, as any marketing genius will tell you, the best way to sell something is to create the problem, make people afraid, and then sell the solution. Which of course, she sells a supplement that is supposed to blunt postprandial blood glucose excursions. Now again, she may really believe this stuff, but I would like to see how she addresses this data in particular, if she even does address it. In my opinion, you guys can save your money on that stuff, but you do you. If you like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you next week.